Perfect. So I think we're all set. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Future Energy Outlook and Desired Workforce Skill Set for Students webinar. Uh, we've had some couple technical di difficulties, so I've um, eliminated the video, but uh, you'll be able to hear me during the presentation. Uh, we just want to say thank you for joining us during this unprecedented time uh, where you finish the semester from home, and I'm sure you are all uh, busy preparing for final exams. During these challenging times, we hope this webinar can provide you with some insightful information about the future of the energy industry and the required skill sets that will set you up for success. Uh, so my name is Lauren Kibler, and I am the Program Director for UH Energy at the University of Houston. Our department is an umbrella organization for the university to strategic <coughs> energy industry, a trained workforce, provide strategic and technical leadership as well as research and development for needed innovations and technologies. We have an excellent panel this afternoon and I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. I'd like to recognize the President's Energy Advisory Board. The board is made up of industry experts and leaders who give UH and UH Energy strategic guidance to advance energy education and research. It is with the help of two Energy Advisory Board members that we were able to put on this webinar today. During the presentation, we encourage you to submit your questions for the panel uh, through this link. And uh, you'll be able to submit your questions and they will um, show up for us real time for us to ask the panel. Uh, so I'd like to introduce the panel here today. Uh, first, we have Scott Nyquist, who is a director and senior partner in the management consulting firm McKinsey and Company. He serves energy and industrial companies in matters of strategy, organization, and performance improvement. He has assisted integrated oil companies, independent exploration and production companies, national oil companies, electric utilities, and industrial companies in the energy industry. Uh, before joining McKinsey, Scott obtained his MBA from Harvard Business School, worked for Exxon Production Research in Houston, and graduated from the University of Michigan with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. Scott's Houston community involvement includes uh, board membership on the Houston Symphony Board of Trustees, the Greater Houston Partnership Board of Directors, Rice University's Jones School, Council of Overseers, and most recently the University of Houston's Energy Advisory Board. Our next speaker is William, or better known as Bill Maloney, he is currently on the board of directors uh, of Trident Energy and serves as an energy advisor to Warburg Pincus. Bill retired from Stat Oil, just currently known as Equinor, in uh, 2015, where he was executive vice president leading the business development and production in North America. In this capacity, he played a key role in Stat Oil's corporate executive committee and was Stat Oil's senior executive in North America. Bill serves on AAPG's Corporate Advisory Board. Before he retired from Stat Oil, Bill also served on the National Petroleum Council and was a member of the board of API. Bill began his career with Shell Oil Company in Houston in 1981. His first role was a geologist in the Rocky Mountain Division. And over time in his career, he took on positions of increasing responsibility in the U.S. and the international arena. Upon leaving Shell in 1995, Bill served as the regional manager for Latin America. He attended Syracuse University, where he received a Master of Science in Geology. And next up, we have Steve Irving, the current Senior Vice President for BC America. Cindy earned her Master's of Science in Geology from UNC after receiving a Bachelor of Science in Geology from SMU. Cindy's specialities include exploration and technology, and she most recently led the working team for the U.S. National Petroleum Council study on carbon capture, use, and storage. Cindy is chair of the Offshore Technology Conference and serves on the board of directors for BPX and P in the Greater Houston Partnership. She is BP's executive sponsor for Princeton University and serves on the advisory council for the UT Jackson School and the Executive Board of Dedman College, SMU. Cindy has served as an AAPG Distinguished Lecturer and was named a legend in exploration 
by the organization. She is an active in women's development and STEM education and has been recognized for her leadership and energy by numerous organizations. So now that we've introduced the panel, I'd like to kick it off to Scott to tell us his thoughts on the, the future of the energy industry. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and, and thank everyone for uh, joining in this webinar. Uh, before I get into uh, uh, just a, a short summary view of the outlook, I thought I'd just uh, start off by saying that I think the energy industry, uh, despite the challenges it's facing at the moment, will continue to be a, a vital and uh, growing part of our uh, U.S. and global economy and there'll be amazing opportunities to uh, build a career in that industry. And you think about uh, the type of skills that uh, the energy industry values, I, I like to describe it as the, uh, the T, where it's useful to be very deep in one area, the vertical axis, the T, whether that's accounting or mechanical engineering or law or business, but some area that you have depth in. And then you also are broad, the, the cross part of the T, where you understand industry, understand the trends, and uh, know how to work with people of other skill sets to, to solve problems. And while you're spending your time at uh, U of H, you have this uh, enormous opportunity to work on both dimensions of, of the T, getting deeper in some areas of your uh, passion but also continuing to expand uh, the breadth of your capabilities and using this moment of time uh, where you have to work from home to uh, you know, learn as much as you can about the industry to prepare, to prepare yourself uh, for the future. So with that, let me just uh, uh, spend a little bit of time just describing uh, kind of where we are in the uh, energy industry. And of course, it all comes back to, the, uh, to this horrible virus. And, uh, McKinsey has been uh, privileged to be working with many institutions really around the world on trying to understand how the virus is progressing and uh, how to help hospitals get the supply chains they need and help also help how to get the economy back working. And we spent a lot of time talking to various economists around what are the uh, kind of macroeconomic implications of this. And there's kind of two uh, main views, although there's hundreds of scenarios, but one view is what people describe as the V-shaped recovery, where we have a steep decline in GDP, but then we come roaring back. And uh, this, of course, is the optimistic scenario <clears throat> that we are able to get the disease contained and people go back to work, not only in the U.S., but around the world. And, uh, of course, China has been uh, on that path uh, recently, at least we, we hope so. Unfortunately, I would say most of the executives that we talk to uh, are, are nervous about believing that the V recovery will come in. And instead, most are advocating or are preparing for what was called a muted recovery, where we have a steep decline as we're going through at the moment as people shut down activity really around the world. Then it takes some time for the global economy and the U.S. economy to get moving again, even with very uh, aggressive government interventions. And it may take uh, two, three years before the uh, GDP gets back to where we were uh, even last year. So the reason why this is so important, this is really what drives you know, the outlook for the energy industry. Uh, if we just go through a few of the segments, uh, oil and gas has been hit particularly hard by this. As soon as the economies are shut down, people stop flying on airplanes, people have stopped driving their cars, uh, and created an enormous and rapid short-term decline in demand. Some 25 to 30 percent of global demand literally disappeared in a matter of weeks. It's unheard, nothing like this we've seen in our industry ever before. And of course, what happens is when you, the demand disappears, the oil keeps coming out of the ground because we've made all these investments and it's still producing. And so it just keeps coming. Then the tanks start getting filled up and we have, you know, operational challenges where to put all this oil. And we saw this kind of crazy world of negative crude prices in the futures market last week as people have all this oil and there's no place to store it and crazy, causing crazy behaviors. And, and what really will drive the oil industry 
to come back is how quickly will people be flying in airplanes and how quickly will people be driving cars again and have this demand come back. And this is all, of course, related to the virus. And you know, we're estimating it could be two to four years before really people get comfortable enough to get that demand back. Uh, and some more pessimistic scenarios say a bit longer. Uh, but it will come back, and uh, particularly in uh, developing countries around the world that are growing their economies, we anticipate that they'll be, uh, once they get through this uh, virus, and particularly when a vaccine is found, we'll, we'll uh, see lots of uh, aggressive demand growth really around the world. So that's oil and gas. Now, the good news is, is that some of the other fuels are not getting hit as badly. Uh, the power sector uh, is, is, has demand down a little bit with, uh, uh, as industry is shut down, the automobile industry is kind of shut down, so they're not purchasing as much electricity, but the demand has not been hit as hard. This is very much an essential service. People are living at home and consuming lots of energy at home, and the offices are still turned on in many places. So that industry is doing okay, and we also expect it to come back you know, very quickly. And uh, natural gas also will uh, uh, be uh, in better shape than oil. It's been hit a little bit harder than power, uh, but given the low prices and the demand of the power sector, it, it's been hit a little bit, but uh, it'll, it'll come back very quickly as well. And of course, solar and wind uh, operations are just keep on going. With that said, people are, are postponing uh, investments in solar, wind, and everything else because of the uh, slowdown in, in, in the economy. So we, we uh, are optimistic that once we get the global economy running again, energy demand will come back and we'll, we'll still have to deal with the enormous challenges of the energy transition. We're going to need you know, all of the above uh, fuels. We're going to need oil and gas to uh, continue to provide the needs of, of transportation uh, you know, around the world. Power will continue to grow in demand and, and grow a bit faster than uh, other fuels and uh, wind and solar and other low carbon fuels will, will play a, a key role. And the whole topic of carbon management, uh, once the economy comes back again, will probably take a two, three year time out of, of dealing with a crisis, but then we'll get back to dealing with the, the issues of, of the environment. And what's happened, uh, just to spend a minute or two, just talk about how companies have responded to that. You know, the first thing that companies do is they focus on their workforce. And uh, they, they sort the workforce into those that are essential workers that need to be uh, in the operations to keep the oil refineries, oil fields, petrochemical plants working. And they had to design new procedures to ensure that they are practicing social distance. And then they put all their staff and anyone who could to work from home. And so we're all trying to learn how to work in a, a virtual world with Zoom calls every day and how to build a team, how to get to know people on Zoom. This is kind of a, the environment that um, many energy companies or any energy company that we serve is, is, is dealing with. So that has been a huge task. Then a second task has been just to avoid going to bankruptcy. I mean, you, you lose so much demand and uh, the revenue stop coming in. Uh, many companies are in severe financial distress, and so they're cutting expenses aggressively, cutting their capital programs, particularly the oil and gas companies, and uh, uh, to ensure that they can survive. And I think many companies now are getting through that phase of, of cutting and are beginning to focus more on the long term, and which is begin to think through, you know, how can they win? Uh, and uh, once we get through this, uh, this uh, uh, terrible virus. So that's uh, just a short kind of summary of the industry. I'll just make one comment on McKinsey and how we're working and how we're you know, um, organizing ourselves. Everybody's working from home. And, and uh, when you work in the management consulting industry, you work on teams. So every morning starts off with a Zoom call with the team present and uh, you lay out what the goals are for uh, the work that needs to be done for the whole team and then everybody goes away and works on their piece and you have your various you know, meet, Zoom meetings during the day and then at the end of the day you come back together and uh, uh, sort out what uh, was concluded. And so in many ways in our profession, and you find this true with lawyers as well that I've spoken to, it, it's, it hasn't been that difficult to transition to, uh, to work at home versus in the office because you're so used to working on teams. Now we found it quite difficult with people who have uh, you know, families and uh, now you have a big family with two working couples at home trying to manage the family and continue professionally. 
Uh, so there's a lot of stresses into the system. But so far from a day-to-day uh, -day point of view, we've had it uh, much easier than many other um, uh, businesses that uh, you just can't operate in, in, this, in this world. But let me just stop there. I can go on for a long time, but I just wanted to give that a uh, bit of introduction. Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott, for sharing those thoughts. Uh, Bill, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of, of what's been happening and, and what's, what the foreseeable future holds? Sure. Well, first, let me thank you, of age for doing this and putting us all together to speak to you and for the, let me look, 69 folks that are online, thank you for being here as well. Um, I give a talk at a lot of universities that I have in the past called Oil Shocks from the Past and Lessons from the Future. And one conclusion of that talk is that we will recover. There has not been an oil price shock that we have seen that the world has not recovered. Oil price is really a symptom of supply and demand being at balance as it is at the moment. And one way or another, it does rebound and it does rebound. Now, today we've got two black swan events at once. First time in my career that I've seen this happen where we have a, a demand reduction seriously because of COVID-19 and we have way too much supply because of lots and lots of reasons, not including uh, some testosterone from Saudi Arabia and Russia causing some of that to happen as well. Um, but what that's going to do is force a rebalancing with, with storage in Cushing, Oklahoma and in boats around the world being at or near full. It's going to force wells to shut in. It's going to force companies to cut back on their production. Um, and in the end, companies and countries need stability, right? Countries like Saudi Arabia need the money that they get from oil and gas to put social programs to work and all that and run their country. And you can't do it at $20 a barrel. And an oil and gas company can't run at $20 a barrel. The marginal barrel, well, what I mean by that is the price of oil that you need to get, say, a 10% profit, today is around $60 to $65 a barrel. The world would run quite nicely if prices would just stay there and be stable. Companies could plan, governments can plan. We, we will get back there. The big question is how long is that going to take? And then how long is a piece of string? I don't think any of us can really answer that question. You know, Scott mentioned, is it, is it V-shape or U-shape? I, I don't know. All I do know is that we will come out the other end because it, the, by one way or another, by either brute force or some sublime negotiations, we will get back to a balanced oil and gas position, which means prices will stabilize. Um, as far as the future is concerned, you know, for the next 30 plus years, we will be using oil and gas in significant quantities. There is no doubt in my mind about that. 20 years ago, fossil fuels represented 81% of global energy. It's pretty much the same today. And as most people look forward, we see increasing population. Right today, we're around 7.2 7 billion people on this planet, projected by 2040 to be 9.2. We see increasing prosperity. We see more and more people coming out of poverty. So the, the challenge for the energy industry in many ways is if you believe that's still going to happen, is how do we make population growth and GDP growth less carbon intensive? And that's a challenge certainly for anyone graduating from U of H today, how we can meet that challenge for, for a sustainable future. Um, one of the things said on, on it was uh, on this, video was what skills needed for the future. Um, I just gave some talks on the future of energy business at Stanford and at UT Austin. I had 10 skills um, that were hard skills and 10 soft skills that I mentioned to everyone. So not to take up too much time, I'll just mention two now and then we can have a conversation later if you'd like to talk about more. The first one uh, as a, in a hard skill is Know the economic value of everything that you do. Whether you're a petroleum engineer or a geoscientist or an accountant, there's an economic value to what you do. And so do you need to take economics classes for that? You know, perhaps yes, but I'll give you another suggestion since you're, many of us are sitting at home, 
uh, binge watch Shark Tank for a little while. <laughs> I mean, you got to, what's the market that you, you're in? What does it cost to produce the product that you're working on? What can you sell that product for? Is the business scalable? You know, I mean, Mark Cuban tells that stuff all the time. Yeah, and it's a bit tongue in cheek, but the basics are all there. So I would suggest watching it and then try to take that, those very simple concepts and put them into your line of work, your business, what your future looks like. It's not, it's a lot of it's common sense. And so I'd advise you to, to really know that because when you're in a company, everything has an economic value and you do work in order to make profits. So knowing how that works and what your piece is, is really important. And it makes you a more valuable employee. Uh, on the softer side, what I would suggest is that you get really good at communication, both written and oral. Whether you talk to two people or 200 people, or whether you write two lines in, in a message or an email, or whether you write 200, clear and concise communication is imperative. It's how you are portrayed to the world. And, it's, and they are both skills that you can learn. Getting good at writing is something that you can skill to get, get well, to get better at. Getting in front of a camera, videoing yourself, seeing how you go, mm, uh, mm, just seeing your personal mannerisms and how you can do better communicating. The, the better you are, the better you will come across. So if I had to just name two, those were the two I would name. And I think uh, I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Cindy. Excellent. Thank you so much for touching on not only the, how students can kind of focus their skill set, but also kind of pick up those soft skills that are so important in business. So, Cindy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to give your little, um, I guess, insights into the energy industry. Oh, hi, everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, just it's God, it's almost impossible following the wisdom of, of Scott and Bill. So. Um, you know, Scott talked about the world stage, uh, gave some color to the sectors and, and energy demands and, and how companies are responding and with some great insights into McKenzie's response. And, and uh, you know, Bill talked about the, you know, alluded to the cyclicity of, of um, industries that are based on, you know, commodities and the, gave the sort of rallying cry, we will recover. Um, I, I liked his optimism and, um, you know, talked a lot about demand and then I especially appreciate, you know, sort of some of the skills. So I'm not going to repeat that, although I kind of just did. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit about sort of uh, put a little bit of color on the cyclicity of things. Um, I started in the you know, sort of mid 80s uh, when I was 12 and um, yeah, sorry, you can hear my son laughing in the background. And, um, you know, w one of the first experiences I had um, was I actually started during a, a, a big price slump. And um, then one day I came to work and they laid off my entire team. And uh, my boss gave me the, um, you know, sort of encouraging pep talk of how much they wanted to lay me off, but HR wouldn't let them because I was too new. Um, and, uh, you know, it was sort of a sober introduction to, um, you know, the volatility of, of, you know, really almost any sort of, of uh, job. You know, I, I chose this industry because of the big complex problems that are created. And I wouldn't want a sort of a cookie cutter, nine to five jobs uh, job. But along with that comes this, you know, this volatility and the, the need to respond. And, and I'm, you know, kind of totally behind uh, with Bill and Scott, as they said, you know, we, we will, will recover. Um, although it's, it's hard and things do sort of put themselves back together in different, different shapes. Um, I think, and anyway, and those cycles, you know, continue. Um, it, I've never seen sort of people paying you 30 bucks a barrel equivalent to for, for your oil, um, like we did this week. But, uh, you know, it, it, we have had some, some crazy times in the past too, and, and we do get through them. Um, I think the thing I'd like to, a couple of things I'd like to tee up on top of the great, great insights that uh, Scott and Bill already shared is, 
you know, in, in this look for opportunities. So there will be opportunities. Um, if you heard a couple, go ahead and, and uh, do some binge watching. Um, you know, this is a good time to really, really focus on, you know, what is it I want to do, explore. There are lots of podcasts, there are lots of webcasts. And of course, you know, finish, uh, finishing up your semester strong. Um, I think out of this, the, the energy transition type of uh, opportunities that we're, we're all engaged in, and I'm sure you're getting a lot through U of H um, in the industry, we're all working on, you know, sort of what's, what will the future look like? Uh, just embrace that, that um, this industry's never really been stagnant. There's so many things that we do routinely today, um, like produce offshore. Um, and, uh, you know, image, uh, th you know, uh, sensors for, for wells. Um, you know, these are all things that, uh, you know, somebody couldn't do them at one time and then people challenge that dogma, uh, move ahead, create huge opportunities for uh, individuals, for wealth and uh, you know, for um, countries. And it's, you know, it's out of this sort of uh, challenging times always comes opportunities. Um, so I personally am super excited about the energy transition the opportunity to decarbonize and, and go to a, a negative uh, carbon scenario because that's what the world needs. Um, I can say from a BP perspective, that is our primary focus. And early February, uh, bless our heart, our new CEO, Bernard Looney, started on February 6th. And then um, with a complete rewiring of the company, um, uh, lots and lots of focus on new energy streams and decarbonizing our old ones, big audacious commitments uh, to decarbonize. And then, you know, is, is having to do all of this, lead through all this with, with COVID. So, you know, you, you kind of never know what the world's gonna get to you. So, um, but, but do take advantage of trying to, you know, look at the energy transition. Um, I talk to a lot of people at work who are relatively new into the industry. And they're like, I don't know that that stuff. And so, um, you know, are my skills, my degree in petroleum engineering, uh, my degree in geology with a focus on petroleum and sedimentary rocks, did I, did I do the wrong thing? And I would say, you know, absolutely not. Um, rocks are rocks. Engineering is engineering. Fluids are fluids, except when they're solids or gases. So that's a whole nother um, you know, thermodynamic challenge. But the skills that you learn in school and the skills that you learn in a job, they are transferable. What you want to do is you want to learn the economic value of what you do. You want to learn how to problem solve. And you certainly need to be really, really strong at your technical craft. I think the, the trunk of that T that Scott, um, that Scott talked, teed up, sorry. And all of that will take you through um, this industry and any others with, with uh, great power. And I guess I'd like to just sort of close on, um, in addition to being able to problem solve and really, really knowing your craft, because those are two things I, I um, constantly remind people of and have to remind myself. I'll add a couple of skills. They may be on Bill's, Bill's longer list or not. I think, um, in, in this industry, you have to be very flexible. And that's kind of been teed up by some of the earlier words. Things change, things can change overnight as we've all seen. And it's not just this industry, it's, it's life. Um, so always retain that sort of flexibility. Look for the opportunities that are created by these sort of um, rapid changes. Um, challenge the dogma. Um, of people's thinking so that you can create, you know, look for the opportunities that uh, are found. You know, I always find uh, that when, when people say you can't do something, there's opportunity there. So I, I look for that. And then I think uh, just be tenacious. Um, you know, if, if your job's, summer job has been frozen, look for a way to acquire the same skills in, you know, in a, in a different way. Um, 
and continue to build relationships as best you can and continue to, to uh, strengthen your studies. So be tenacious in, in that. And I think with that, I'll turn the floor back over to Lauren to move on with the uh, rest of the session. And thank you guys. Excellent. Well, thank you, Cindy, for that, uh, that insightful kind of introduction. Uh, we do have lots of questions coming in from students, so I'll ask the, the first one here. And uh, Scott, I know you touched a little bit about um, the investment of renewables, but uh, this student's question is, how do you see the impact of COVID-19 playing out on the renewable energy industry? Well, let me just uh, describe what I see happening in the short term uh, and then the long term. I, I think in the, in the short run, uh, there'll be a, a slowdown in, in uh, investment in renewables uh, just because the economy is slowed and so there'll be uh, uh, less need to kind of inv make investments in anything related to uh, you know, power generation. And also companies will have less capital to, to spend because they're going to be facing uh, you know, financial pressure. So I'm anticipating a bit of a slowdown. I, I would also say that the competitiveness of renewables is going to be hit very hard by these very low uh, hydrocarbon prices. You know, natural gas prices are so low now. Their natural gas is gaining share in power generation uh, around the world uh, by cutting back on coal and then blocking any new uh, renewables without you know, massive subsidies. So I think it will be a, a short-term slowdown in uh, renewable investment. Uh, but then once we get through this, uh, whether it uh, happens immediately with a V-shaped recovery or a bit longer, uh, the world will, needs to get down the path to lower carbon emissions. And there's a lot of political will to make it happen. So I think the subsidies will come back and uh, support growth in renewables. And the economics of renewables on their own are also improving. So the combination of better cost and subsidies will enable it to uh, to come back into the market and grow, but it will be a bit of a time out, I think, for, for um, renewables. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And certainly as the pandemic continues and, and we experience longer times of being sequestered from home, that will definitely have a further economic impact and certainly impact the renewable industry. So thank you for that insight. Um, we also touched a little bit about on price and, and as we build, I'm uh, kind of talking about the ability to kind of uh, produce within a kind of a 10% uh, margin and, and the industry to make money. Um, how do you see the oil producing nations kind of getting back to a price stability from where we currently are today? Thanks for the question. Um, it's going to take further production cuts uh, across the board uh, here in the United States um, as well as around the world. So uh, let me take here in the U.S. first. Um, there's already, given uh, the announced cuts by some companies and well should have, about 750,000 barrels of oil in the U.S. market today. That will probably go up to a million barrels a day before too long. What do I mean before too long? By like June. And could, there are some people that prognosticate that up to three to four million barrels could come off the US Canadian market before the end of the year in adjustment to what is happening at the moment. Uh, I think we'll see similar declines in production in other parts of the world. I don't have as many details on those as I just did for the US, but that in turn, with that production coming down, will help rebalance the market. And then the other question, which I don't have an answer to, is how long it's going to take for all the, all the oil that is in storage to be used up before the production get to a more steady state. So uh, that's a long answer to basically production has got to come down. It is already coming down. And hopefully uh, even more action will take place by OPEC plus take care of their side of the equation. I think economics will take care of it in, uh, in North America. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, so we have a, a student who is currently uh, a summer intern with BP, Cindy, uh, and is looking at the future of commodities trading and, uh, and the IT infrastructure required. 
Do you see greater opportunities for students who have kind of a computer science background in the um, uh, energy trading positions? Wow. Well, um, welcome to BP. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope that it works out to be a, a, great, uh, a great opportunity. Um, our trading, you know, it, it's, it's a fascinating, um, it's a fascinating field. And um, one of the things I like our um, CEO of our, our GATS uh, trading in the US, he, he actually, I've heard him say historically that really trading is about uh, you know, having a, a great intellect, uh, good intuition, and uh, you know, kind of nerve feel. He didn't say that part was me. Um, but uh, so I think that um, his view is that if you've got this sort of skills and insights and uh, and sort of acumen to be a trader that you can come from almost any different background. You need a lot of training. You need to be uh, really up to speed on regulatory and um, a lot of, you know, there are a lot of ethics and compliance as well as financial and economic sides to that. Um, that being said, I think anything with a uh, digital background is, is really going to help you understand the nuts and bolts of what's happening inside that trading universe and uh, probably really help you uh, become a, a really, really strong trader because you're going to understand a lot of the sort of triggers and mechanisms behind uh, the scenes and also you know, just sort of what's happening because all the trading is, is uh, happening in a, in a digital world right now. So, uh, I think trading will not be restricted to digital. It is something that, um, you know, we would welcome anybody who's got that kind of interest and acumen to explore. But I would say your background in digital will definitely uh, give you some, uh, and infrastructure will give you some, a leg up on just sort of understanding the mechanics and the, the holistic systems approach of what's happening around you as these decisions are, you know, split second decisions are made. So, and welcome again. Excellent. So uh, I know we've heard lots of bu buzzwords like machine learning and AI. And how is BP uh, dealing with these new technologies? And is this impacting energy trading or any other parts of your business model? Sorry, I was, can you repeat the question, Lauren? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we hear lots of, of the buzzwords about machine learning and AI. And the students just wondering um, how that will affect energy trading and your larger business model. Energy trading or just energy in general? Uh, let's say energy in general. Okay, okay, definitely. Um, you know, the energy company of now, actually, and definitely of the future is, is you know, becoming more and more digital. And, you know, if you kind of miss the digital boat, you're, you're missing the future. Um, we are integrating a lot of um, AI into our sort of production control systems and um, you know, really decisions and uh, challenges, issues that, that might have taken us hours and even days to identify and solve in the past. We are able to develop tools to optimize, you know, flag opportunities, flag challenges, and, and deal with them now in, in seconds. It's, it's fantastic. And so we're, we're um, using more and more sort of artificial intelligence um, and the, the toolkits around that to enhance our business. Um, we're using uh, a lot of uh, like things like augmented reality. And, uh, you know, so if you need to replace a valve in an onshore um, pad, you can do that, you know, sort of with, you know, by holding up your iPad and that's sort of here and now and, and working, um, you know, as we speak, just, just integrating a lot of, of things to make things safer and um, optimize. Um, I think just and I'm sure that Scott and Bill will want to comment on this, 
But the, the last thing that I would like to highlight is where we can use, um, you know, machines for inspection, machines to repair means that we're generally making what we believe is going to be a safer environment because you're not actually putting a person out into, uh, into a position to, uh, you know, with a wrench or a hammer, you're actually able to so uh, address those things through, um, you know, something that is designed to actually address that particular challenge, fix it, and, and you know, if, if anyone's in harm's way, it's, it's a machinery, not a, a human being. And so I never, I hate to say this, but it's about dehumanizing a lot of the uh, tasks um, that come in an operating, whether it's a refinery or, um, or out in, in the field in an um, oil and gas production facility. So we're embracing digital. Um, it's, you know, we really are a high tech industry. And so you know, it's kind of bring it on uh, more and more. I, I think um, Scott and Bill want to add to that. So um, thanks, Cindy. Um, yeah, I do. Forever, and I think in the future, energy companies are technology companies, both in the development sense and most certainly in the applications. And there's lots of examples of that through the world. If you look forward, I mean, unmanned platforms offshore is the technology that's that started and is continued to happen. If we are going to really tackle the challenge of lowering our carbon footprint as an industry, technology is going to have to help that. All, all of the solar panels and windmills in the world are not going to bring it down. Technology is going to do that through things like Cindy worked on in carbon capture, utilization, and storage, and others, uh, new hydrogen economy, etc. It's going to take technology to make that happen. If we're going more and more these days in adding new resources, it's technology that has helped us to do that. The past couple of years, we've added more oil and gas from changing the slope of a decline curve in an existing oil and gas field, most of that through technology, through either better completion techniques, and better enhancement of, re of reservoirs, better visualization of reservoirs in the subsurface. I was on a board call this morning and I saw a 4D data set of a field that's been 20 years old and all of a sudden new pay horizons are coming out on the data that you couldn't see in, in, a, in an old data set. It's another example of technology coming to the forefront and it's applicable across operations, it's applicable in geoscience and engineering and it's going to be applicable for new energy as well. Scott? Yeah, I'll just pile on and, and uh, say that, you know, in our industry, we've, we've always been employing uh, new tools and techniques to solve problems. And you coming out of University of Houston will be familiar with some of the cutting edge uh, approaches to solving problems. And, and the story that, that I'd like to tell is that when I first uh, joined McKinsey after coming out of business school, you know, I was a... Uh, 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 at the cutting edge of new technology. I was lugging around this massive uh, compact personal computer and I know how to use this spreadsheet called Lotus 123, which became Excel. And my clients were just completely blown away by my extraordinary use of technology, okay? So you guys will have coming out knowledge of some new technologies that will wow us old guys, but we don't have a clue what it is. And that's something that you can take with you coming out of a university. Excellent. Thank you all. So obviously we've talked a lot about technology and, and skill sets. I guess the ongoing crisis is be, being called an opportunity for reskilling and upskilling. So how would your, how are your organizations reacting to this? Sorry, I missed that because the, there's a delivery guy at the door. <laughs> Challenges of Zoom. <laughs> Sorry. No problem at all. So uh, we're obviously talking a lot about, uh, about skill development, especially for uh, students at the University of Houston. Um, we're, with the crisis, is this an opportunity for, I guess, even graduating students to reskill and upskill to uh, kind of make themselves um, kind of the, the top of the, the crop, I guess? Well, 
I'll build on, um, you know, something Bill introduced earlier and, and I alluded to, um, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot to, to be gained by having this acumen and this understanding of, of jargon in uh, economic side and um, certainly um, reading and learning more about economic projections and energy outlooks, sort of uh, some of the things that uh, Scott alluded to. You know, there's a great um, BP energy outlook that will give you lots of ideas of what uh, many of the other, you know, sort of factors going into um, to future energy growth and demand and uh, energy mixes and certainly um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency has that Department of Energy has a lot of uh, really great materials. Exxon's got an excellent energy outlook as does Shell. And so I think um, in sort of upskilling, I, I don't know that you have to go learn a whole nother, um, you know, another tool. Uh, but I do think learning uh, the you know more about the in environment, uh, you know the the terminology, the outlooks, and the predictions will help you uh, a make decisions about your future career, but um, you know also uh, help you be much more relevant and able to engage in the conversations, whether they're happening at U of H or um, out in a uh, more corporate setting. So. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, so obviously with a lot of the oil companies and, and energy companies as a whole being particularly hit hard with the crisis, uh, a lot of capital expenditure has been reduced and eliminated uh, amid layoffs and, and pay reductions. Do you see a rise in recruitment uh, anytime soon? Um. I don't know if there'll be a rise, but I think you'll see a lot of my generation uh, going to the exit door. That um, they have had a full uh, career. There are a number of large companies, I won't name any names, that are offering packages to anyone who wants one. Um, and so I think, and my generation, the baby boomers, are the largest generation in quite some time in this industry. And as they exit, it offers opportunity for everyone on this line to take their place. Now, it, it, it's, not going to, it's not going to be a mad rush. It will not happen extremely quickly. It'll probably have, happen slower than you might think. But I do, if, if you look at trends, I, I've seen some trends of, from ExxonMobil. AAPG's got a bunch that they show as well, that the, the, the the curve of the baby boomers is, is going down and down and down and down and down. Uh, and then that has to be made up for in, in the workforce. And that's mostly going to be from younger folks that are graduating now. It'll, it'll take time. Uh, my hope is that uh, recruiting picks up. But uh, the I know the company that I work for is recruiting a lot, but we're very small. So it's, it's, uh, it's a different story. But Scott, do you have anything relative to that as well? No, I think that describes where we, we have this, you know, aging generation of uh, staff in the energy industry that um, is going to be exiting and that's going to create opportunities. I agree with, you know, Bill on that. And I would just also say that their energy industry is, is vast and there are some segments of the industry that will continue to, to hire uh, at, at their usual levels and some of the segments that may be under more pressure. So the, the power industry will just keep on going. The chemical industry will keep on going. I think we're finding is a, a little bit of a bump, but it should be coming back soon. You know, midstream. At the moment, the upstream is probably the one that's facing the, the biggest, you know, near-term, you know, uh, uh, struggle in the, the service industry. So if you look at the energy industry broadly, there, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, some before we talked about the trading aspect, you know, the whole commercial side of this business will uh, also will, will continue to, to be there. So energy industry is a big industry. There are some segments that will be uh, uh, hiring. Can I make another point uh, to the earlier question that Cindy answered on reskilling and upskilling? Um, whether you're a geoscientist of whatever shape or type or an engineer 
you got knowing how fluids move in the subsurface, which they don't care about what the reservoir looks like. They don't care about structure. They just move on physical properties. But we're in the business of getting oil in and out of a reservoir or gas in and out of a reservoir. And understanding how that works and how fluids move is really, really important. And I didn't get that when I first started, but I, but I do now, and it makes a huge difference. Second point, so I'll go, that's, so that's a hard one. I'll, go, I'll give you another soft one. And that is, no one has ever succeeded in anything in life unless they had both the will and the skill. Cindy and Scott both touched on this in a different way. You've got to have the skills. So you've got to know what you're doing and in within your field. But being the smartest person in the room is not enough. Having persistence, perseverance, determination. Cindy said being tenacious. You can need both of those together. Without having will and skill and applying them equally, you will not succeed. You won't succeed as a musician. You won't succeed as, as a petroleum profession. I say musician because that's a drum set behind me. Uh, but, you know, it, it matters. And so I, my encouragement to you is not only to learn as much as you can and always stay current, but also have grit and determination always because that's going to make a difference. That's it for now. Thanks. Excellent. That's very impactful. One, one, we're coming up short on time here, but I guess one maybe potentially last question. What would you tell a graduating senior from high school interested in energy as to what kind of career and education pathway they should choose? Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I, oh, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. You've got the screen. Um, I'd say be ready for the wildest ride of your life uh, in an industry that matters to everyone on this planet. But one thing you have to do is embrace change from the first day because it will always happen from the second day you're at the job until the last day you're there and after that. So be flexible and enjoy it. It is a wonderful industry and it will be here for a very long time. I agree with, with that. Could probably couldn't say it better. Um, but you know, a high schooler, I, and I just had one last year, so she's a, um, a freshman in college now. You know, I would, first of all, encourage them to do it, find what you love. Because you're going to be, you know, sort of uh, doing this kind of work for for decades, hopefully, and and so you know, really, really in, enjoy enjoy that aspect of things. Um, and if you do something you love, it will translate into uh, you know into a career somehow in in wild and weird ways. Um, for me, I always loved rocks, so that's super nerdy. Um, but it has just, uh, you know, kind of always carried me through this fantastic career, and I feel blessed to have had so many different opportunities. So I would say, if you're considering um, a career in an in energy, come on in, embrace the energy challenge, learn those fundamental skills, uh, learn those first principles of of science and engineering. And I'll repeat something that Bill said that I think is really, really important, uh, is learn to communicate. And um, so along with uh, all those technical skills that you'll be uh, developing, take advantage of the opportunities to give talks and lead, um, lead conversations as an informal facilitator or as a formal presenter. Scott. Yeah that you know when my kids were high schoolers going to university and there's all this uh, stressing about uh, you know what kind of major should I you know focus on during my time and uh, you know I would always tell them that uh, just find something that you like and go do it and, and make sure that you do it well and, and follow your passion because where you start uh, say you start in the energy industry is not where you'll end up particularly when you're in your 20s, you really don't know what you're going to end up liking even after you spent four years in university. So just jump in, try something, have a positive attitude, uh, get beaten down for failures and take advantage of those moments when you're successful and then uh, purge ahead. And then, you know, 30 years later, you'll end up somewhere completely different than where you started. Excellent. That's 
definitely the case. And I've noticed that in my own career kind of throughout my 20s and into my 30s. So uh, thank you for that. And I guess with a few minutes left, do any of you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom for our students? I would just say it's, it's such an extraordinary time to, uh, when you're in university, you just don't even realize it. The, the, the freedom and flexibility you have to explore new areas, to meet new people, try new things. So just, uh, I know you're probably you know, working hard to kind of you know, finish up, but take every moment of opportunity to go learn new things that the, this great university is offering you. It's a special experience, a special moment in your life. Um, I would say, looking forward, be solution oriented. It's great to, to criticize different things in different ways, but always have an improvement suggestion when you think, when you think something can be better. Be a good colleague. Um, helping others will help you in the long run. And then always, always have a positive attitude and enjoy yourself. Life is too short not to. Cindy, any yeah, um, excellent. And I guess I would just add, you know, know, know your craft and, and, and do it really, really well. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I've been muted by the host many times during this session. Right, Kyle? Um, uh, know your craft. Um, be really, really good at, at what you do. Bring those, those technical skills, whatever they are, to the table, and they will serve you well. Um, challenge the dogmatic thinking that you will you know, encounter. You will encounter it in college, and, and you'll encounter it out in, in, in work, too. Um, and look for opportunities. Um, look for opportunities, especially if, if they're, you're in a dire situation, because they are, they are there. And I think... Um, kind of Scott and Bill both kind of touched on this, but uh, you, know, you need to collaborate, uh, work well with others, um, give credit where credit is due, because that kind of comes back to you uh, in spades throughout, the, uh, throughout college and also throughout your career. So I would just like to, uh, to wish you well um, in, in every aspect, uh, both personally and uh, technically and professionally. And thank you so much for including me and sorry about the dogs and the delivery guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining us and for sharing all these words of wisdom and great insights into an industry that can be somewhat intimidating from an outsider. So we appreciate all of your time and, and to our audience, thank you for submitting all of your questions. Uh, it was great to engage, albeit virtually with all of you uh, since that we, we can't be on campus, even though I'm currently on campus. Um, but thank you all again, and, uh, and we hope this was informative and enjoyable. So thank you. And with that, thank I you. think we'll, we'll conclude the day. So congratulations on finishing your the last day of classes, and, and good luck on everyone's final exams.